Hello everyone, welcome back to the channel. I've got a special species to share with you guys today. Uh, it's a group that I haven't really shown in one of these more long, uh, long format educational videos before. Uh, one of the largest groups of carnivorous plants in the world is the genus Utricularia, the bladder warts. Uh, named for the modified leaves that are formed usually underground or underwater that look like little tiny bladders and are some of the fastest moving structures on earth. Some of these species can uh, uh, trigger, uh, suck in their prey, and snap close within a two thousandth of a second, which is faster than most cameras can actually pick up. Uh, when people talk about bladder warts, uh, this is a genus that is found worldwide from uh, high arctic uh, environments into the tropics, uh, semi-desert areas that go dry during summer, all the way into uh, rainforest areas, epiphytes in high cloud forests and jungle. And what most people might think of when they first hear the term bladderwort is those smaller species uh, that usually live in the water or in a terrestrially in wet ground that produce little tiny leaves, which are actually modified stems, if you believe it, because the bladders are the true original leaves but they produce the little modified leaves that uh, spread out across the ground and then tiny little flowers that pop up on occasion. However, the, there is a group of bladder warts, uh, two different sections within the genus that are rather famous for being much, much larger than most species in a number of different ways. A lot of them produce larger bladders. Some of them produce the largest traps in the genus. Uh, a lot of them produce very, very large uh, stolons, the leaves that they uh, have, and they also produce some of the biggest flowers in the group. Now, one of the most widespread and easiest to grow of those is this one right here. You can see we got the big leaves coming out here and then the flower that sits way high up above them. This is Utricularia, uh, Utricularia alpina. This is a cultivar called Pity Your Moon because it comes from Henny uh, Henry Pittier National Park in Venezuela, originally. Uh, this is a member of the Orchidioides section of uh, Utricularia. These are primarily epiphytic species, or species that will, in some cases, live in like the urns of bromeliads uh, on high mountains. And so they tend to live in much more uh, dry, mossy habitats on... Um, like the trunks of trees, again in uh, bromeliad sometimes, uh, on mossy cliff faces in fairly cool environments. Uh, these guys are primarily South American. Uh, this is one species that actually extends out of South America. This particular species is found in much of northern South America. You can find it from Colombia to uh, Guyana and north uh, east Brazil. But you can also find it stretching up into the Lesser Antilles Islands. So uh, St. Lucia, Montserrat, Martinique, as far north, in fact, as Jamaica. And this species tends to produce a small cluster of these modified stems, which look like leaves now, uh, that typically get to about between 5 and 7 inches long. They have this thin petiole that branches out into this roughly spoon-shaped uh, lamina, and that's what they use to uh, photosynthesize, gain uh, their energy. And then, of course, down within the soil here, you can see a couple of sprigs here, and I will try and show a close-up of this later, uh, of the underground stolons, or in this case, in moss, on uh, tree trunks, that actually produce little offshoots that produce all the tiny little bladders in here. And those are craft capturing small organisms that are living in the soil, so springtails, uh, single-celled organisms, things like that. Now, because these guys do live in a bit of a different environment than a lot of other species, they also have a couple of special adaptations that allow them to survive in areas where it may actually go dry for a few weeks to a couple months at a time, and they aren't able to grow actively. And so, again, I will uh, kind of try and show a close-up here. These guys actually produce little tiny storage uh, tubers in the soil that they grow in. These are, they don't really have much energy in them. They're more uh, meant for water storage. 
that allows them to get through those dry periods in between rains or during uh, the dry seasons if they have those in their environment. This is one that might actually experience dry seasons in some places that it grows. So there's a bunch of those little storage tubers as well as the bladders in here that allow them to survive through that dry period until the rains come and they start to regrow. And in cultivation, um, sometimes they actually do best if they experience a slightly drier period. So not quite completely dry, but you go from relatively moist to just barely damp. And if you do that during winter also, that provides several different seasonal uh, triggers that will then cause many of them to produce what they are truly famous for, these huge flowers. Now, as big as this flower is, it is not the biggest in the genus. There are other species like Humboldtii that actually produce even bigger blooms. But nevertheless, this is a very large, very impressive bloom. The plant sends up a stalk that has several bracts on it, and then that will go up and begin to branch out. And on each little uh, peduncle here, you will get one flower up to, uh, on a very happy, healthy plant, you might get 10, 11, 12 or more flowers on a single stalk. Those fold out. You have the calices uh, that kind of hold in and protect the flower bud while it's developing. Uh, and then it will fold out into this huge double lip structure. You have the large lower lip and then the upper lip that kind of hangs almost umbrella like over the top of the palette which has this beautiful yellow streak on it and then inside there's a very narrow throat where uh, very similar to their relatives the butterworts they had this little flap like stigma and then just underneath that are the anthers where the pollen is this species is actually often able to be self-pollinated you just take the pollen and uh, rub it onto that stigma and then down underneath those is a very long nectar spur which you can also see right here as I fold this up. You can see that spur that curves underneath the lower lip and that is where all of the nectar collects. Now as large as these flowers are and as long as that spur is, it takes some special pollinators to actually work with them. Uh, it could be most likely the species that are pollinating, especially these white flowered ones at night, are probably hawk moths, hummingbird moths. Uh, those guys will come in, they have these very long proboscis that they will stick in there and get down into the nectar. And as they're doing that, they're getting their head up inside here and getting coated in pollen. And hopefully then they fly off to another flower and transfer that pollen to the stigma there and then get new pollen on them and so on. And it repeats. Once this flower is pollinated, uh, all this beautiful structure will drop off and it'll produce this little green pod that in the case of this species will eventually swell up and produce hundreds of little tiny brown dust-like seeds. Uh, these seeds are actually pretty uh, easily able to be stored for a few months at least, uh, like in cold storage, and then you just sow them on moss and you let them sprout. As tiny little seedlings, they take a very, very long time to mature, sometimes up to several years before they reach a size like this. Uh, there are other species in this group, though, in the Orchidioides group, that produce slightly different seeds, and they're really interesting. When that pod opens, it looks like this little, like, brown, papery packet with a little green dot in the middle, because they are meant to actually go out and immediately land on a good, wet surface somewhere, and it's actually a fully developed uh, miniature plant inside that. Not really an embryo that needs to develop, an actual plant that will begin to absorb water and then break out and immediately start growing within a couple hours of the seeds falling from the pod. These guys, uh, because they live in an environment that's a little more variable in their, in its nature, uh, the seeds are able to withstand uh, periods of drying out for a while and so can sprout later on, and that helps this colonize a wider spread uh, region. Now, to actually grow these species, uh, Overall, once you get the conditions down, they're not really that hard to grow, but there are a couple of peculiarities that they do need to have in their care in order to do well with them. For this species, uh, you can see it's covered in sphagnum moss here, so I've got mostly kind of a moss, perlite, there's a bit of uh, cocoa chips in here, you could also use bark, uh, a very light kind of airy soil that stays damp uh, fairly readily, uh, even up to slightly wet and then can also dry out a fair bit when I need it to during winter. So light and airy that allows the plant to send out its stolons in through the system and not rot away. Uh, 
and then because these are typically a highland species, this one is a little more uh, tolerant than other species might be, but they generally like cooler temperatures. So daytime getting no higher than maybe 85 degrees Fahrenheit at night, dropping down into at least for this species the low 70s Fahrenheit, uh, if possible down into the 60s or 50s is even better because these guys may grow on mountain sides up to 2,500 meters, so five, 6,000 feet in elevation in some places. So they experience very cool nights. Now those conditions should be kept kind of the same throughout the year. In winter, it can get a little bit cooler and a little bit drier again, because they do experience slight seasons. And so that will then again trigger the flowering. But overall, uh, very cool conditions, very humid, very moist soils and they need a fair amount of light but they are not as uh, light needy as like sundews or most of the pitcher plants so they can actually do pretty well in uh, moderately shady conditions the brighter the light the better because you will get them uh, you'll be giving them more energy of course and they do live often on like the branches of trees in the canopy so they're not being shaded out in the forest floor they are up getting a little more uh, light uh, in kind of the mid-level canopy or the high uh, parts of the canopy or cliff faces. So uh, dappled uh, to very bright artificial light is good. Uh, for most people, it's not going to be feasible to grow these outdoors, so inside is uh, preferable. And decent humidity is also good for them. It helps keep the leaves nice and firm. But this is one species, again, that can often be acclimated to and it can tolerate a little bit lower humidity. So that's one reason it makes a very good beginner species if you're trying to get into the Orchidioides group. So that is about all that I have for this species though. Uh, certainly if you have questions, if there's something that I missed, uh, you can always ask that in the comments down below. But uh, until next time, if there's another species that you'd like to see, certainly you can leave uh, suggestions in the comments or uh, where I will probably hear first and I will take suggestions from first is if you become a member at patreon.com slash hcarlton. Uh, if you're joining there, that helps support production of the educational materials here. It can take a couple of hours to edit videos and get it looking nice, uh, especially when I'm doing my wildlife uh, documentaries. So uh, every little bit of money helps so I can have the time to fund that. Uh, also, if you're a member there, you get exclusive access to early access to the videos. I do seed contests there. Uh, right now, actually, the contest is for a mix of Arizona wildflower seeds. I sometimes have Nepenthes and other things. Uh, there's exclusive merchandise there and more. Uh, if you don't want to sign up for a monthly subscription, there is coffee.com slash Carlton Carnivores. The link for that will be in the video description below. Uh, there, it takes one you can do one-time donations there, or you can buy things at the shop, uh, carltoncarnivores.com, where I usually have all sorts of plants and seeds and sometimes uh, baby reptiles available for sale. Um, let's see. Or actually also at the website, uh, you can also find access to the database and the blog for more information. And certainly if you don't have a means to monetarily support just giving attention to the channel helps. Uh, like the video, comment, share, subscribe. Uh, more attention here helps. And uh, th until next time, if you'd like to see more photos, video clips, and so on, you can always find me on social media, Instagram, TikTok, Facebook, at Carlton Carnivores. But until next time, I'm Hawk and Carlton, and this is Carlton Carnivores.